All right, thank you. So as the introduction said, uh, I'm Beeve, and this is my uh, partner, uh, Mr. Faux Real. Um, we have a lot of ground, uh, a lot of uh, uh, ground to cover today, so I'm going to jump right into it. Um, we are not here representing our employers. We're both security researchers. We do a lot of things. We've been specifically told by uh, our, our employers not to bring their name up, so they will not be in this talk. Uh, we've conducted this research on our own time using our own equipment. Um, we would also like to make it clear that there are things in this talk that may, some people may find offensive. Uh, the fact is, is uh, we do not condone any kind of racism, hate speech, sexism, anti-Semitism, xenophobia, bullying, or online harassment. Uh, the information that uh, some people might find offensive in nature uh, is actually from the posters themselves. It's not actually from us. And there's also another thing that I'd like to remind people of, and this is from our uh, our friends uh, at the EFF, is that breaking terms of services is not breaking the law necessarily. So you can break terms of services, but uh, uh, you want to be careful that you don't, you know, uh, have any legal issues for as part of committing crimes, obviously. But breaking terms of services is not inherently by itself breaking the law. And this was uh, reinforced in July, in July or January of 2018 uh, when the EFF and Oracle had it out about this. So. And this type of stuff that we're doing is inherently dangerous. Um, it, it can be very risky. On June 24th, 2018, Mr. Akimoto, who's a 41-year-old researcher in Japan, uh, was doing a talk not unsimilar to this one. Uh, after he got done with the talk, he was stabbed to death in a bathroom. Um, to mitigate this type of thing, we are not doxing people. So I believe that he was more about really calling out individuals and, and, and bringing them to light. We actually are not in the business of uh, uh, calling individuals out. So we actually, a lot of the stuff that we've done in this particular talk, we try to make, make the people and individuals who are in it uh, anonymized. We're, it, it's not our, our, our place to dox them, we don't believe. Um, and we're also big uh, proponents of free speech. However, uh, and we want people to be able to say what they want and whatnot and not have to be uh, worried about being exposed like that. So to get to the bottom source of this particular project and why I started it and why me for, for real started uh, working on it uh, and why it came about. And um, August 2012, or excuse me, August 12th, 2017, there was a white uh, nationalist rally in Charlottesville, uh, Virginia, uh, called Unite the Right, and a Dodge Challenger uh, ran over some counter protesters at uh, 4, or excuse me, 1.45 p.m. And one of those protesters was Heather Heyer. She was killed by the Dodge Challenger. Uh, she primarily died doing what she wanted to do. She was, you know, protesting. She was, she was counter protesting this thing. And she was only 32 years old. And what I noticed is that around this time on my cell phone, I started seeing new News like this pop up. Uh, this is from Twitter, and uh, this is from a site called Got News. And basically, what it was, they had ID'd the driver of the Challenger, the Dodge Challenger, or so they thought. Uh, Got News immediately, it was kind of apparent that Got News actually didn't know what they were talking about. They were just throwing this information out there. The guy's name was actually uh, Joel. He lived in Michigan, and he started getting death threats from various people all over the country, uh, and had to leave his house under like, police escort and whatnot. And it wasn't even ju just Got News that did this, but it was uh, FreedomDaily.com and Gateway Pundit and other sites uh, that started releasing this information, and, and, and hence that led to Joel being harassed. Um, uh, and having to, to flee. They're actually named in a lawsuit later on, uh, those three websites. Joel took to Facebook and he said, look, I drive a Chevy Impala, not a Challenger, you know, fuck the internet. And I couldn't really agree with him any more than that because the actual person involved was a person named James A. Fields. And he was a 20-year-old uh, uh, individual. Um, he had voiced uh, racist and kind of pro-Nazi thoughts in the past. And he was the actual killer. And uh, one thing I'd like to, to say, so that kind of got me thinking about this type of stuff, fake news, bots, and things of that nature. So um, one thing I'd like to say, if you find it to be a worthy, worthy thing, and I think it is, uh, to consider donating to the Heather Hired uh, Foundation. They provide scholarships for people who are interested in um, legal studies, paralegal studies, uh, social justice, and things of that nature. Um, but with that, we decided to start a project, not 
related to the foundation, but we decided to start a project. So after the incident, um, the project that I had in mind, I actually had with this conference in mind, coming to Hope and presenting here on it. Um, and also at that time, there was a lot of news already out there about fake news and bots, and it was really, really kind of in the, in the, um, uh, in the media. Uh, and in some ways, a lot of our research uh, has, has kind of been done before, but we've added some twist to it. Um, I will point out the research that we're doing, we're primarily focusing, uh, when we talk about fake news and stuff like that, we're talking about uh, uh, American, or, uh, American or what at least appear to be American-based websites or people that are being targeted from American. For instance, there's fake news websites for uh, Italian fake news websites. We're not concentrating on those. We, we don't know the uh, social norms of Italians and whatnot. So what we do is we focus on uh, what we do know, which is mostly uh, American and English-speaking types of sites. Um, but in order to do this, we know that we're going to have to create many, many, many uh, Twitter accounts um, in order to analyze the data. Uh, and we'd also need access to the Twitter API as well. One thing that the Twitter API does is um, requires that your account has a cell phone tied to it. And it's kind of one of the things that they want you to do to keep people from possibly abusing the API. But in today's day and age, you can get unlocked cell phones and, and whatnot fairly cheap, and uh, SIM cards are even cheaper. So for under $5, you can get a, a SIM card. So what we would do is we could, we could purchase SIM cards and create uh, two Twitter accounts that were validated that, could be, uh, that you could use the API. Um, we use one account for kind of a read access and one for a write access, which I'll get into more later. So for $100 or less, you could have 50 uh, validated accounts. Um, I'm sure sophis more sophisticated operations could probably do a lot cheaper. And part of this too was because we wanted to understand necessarily how these operators work. So we wanted to kind of mimic them in some ways. Um, don't even think about using free SMS services. So for instance, if you have an SMS service like, uh, you know, free, I think it's like free smsreceive.com, these things get abused very quickly with um, Twitter, uh, and Twitter, or with Twitter, but they also, uh, uh, Twitter polices these fairly well too. Um, and a little quick word about the Twitter API. The Twitter API has a lot of really good information in it. It has, um, it's your standard API, you make a request about a user or whatnot, and it'll return JSON back. And it's powerful in that it returns a lot of information back for, you know, everything from screen names to location data and whatnot. Uh, this, this is well documented about how the API works. If you're interested in this type of research, uh, feel free to go and uh, read the manual uh, and documentation. It's, it's really actually pretty fun. So we decided to start building some machines. Um, uh, it's actually a group of machines that work together in conjunction with each other. So the first machine that we built, we called the Hunter. And what the Hunter does is it tries to identify bots, bot accounts, uh, fake news poster, postings and posters, uh, and hate speech. We kind of nixed off the hate speech stuff because we found that software inherently uh, is difficult for it to understand context of certain types of speech. So we kind of pulled that off, and plus it was, quite frankly, uh, just depressing to read all the time. So we kind of pulled that off and said, we're just going to concentrate on bots and fake news. Um, so in order to do uh, bot detection, again, we used the, uh, the Twitter API, the kind of like a read access kind of thing. And it, it, what the, the, the Hunter does is it basically goes out there and watches for trending uh, topics, uh, trending hashtags. It watches for uh, predetermined hashtags and other things, and then see who's talking about it, and then creates a kind of a scoring mechanism. We've done this in the past, for instance, like with malware, where we say, uh, we have a piece of software that executes. Um, this is kind of uh, uh, something that we do, but we, we, we uh, execute some, an executable, and then what we do is we watch its behavior, and based on its behavior, we create a score, and if a score meets a certain threshold, we can say, oh, we believe this might be malware. So we did the sign of the same thing that we did with uh, um, uh, bots, is to create that kind of same thing. So what we did is, um, uh, it might go after the times that the accounts were created or uh, 
characteristics of the name or uh, were certain properties of the account set up properly or not set up at all. And typically, one score doesn't typically cause the whole thing to fall down. That is, so if we ha you might have an account that has a score uh, that might trigger off three or four different behaviors, but still not be considered a bot because the, the score wasn't registered that high. There are other characteristics. So for instance, an individual who's tweeting 300 tweets per day, you'd turn around and say, that's probably not a human. And then we actually make that score higher. So, um, so that's how we kind of did the scoring. On the fake news side of, side of things, we took 421 fake news domains. Now, when we talk about fake news, we're not talking about parody uh, domains or anything like that. We're talking about extremely left or extremely right uh, uh, wing uh, domains that either have really loaded or misleading information in them or that they are just blatantly false. You know, things like it wasn't uncommon to come to some of these sites and they would have this news article and right next to it it'd say, you know, hair growth in three days and Obama is a lizard. So what we would do is say that's probably not really news. So, um, so keep that in mind. And we also used, uh, uh, well, to get on with it, we, but how do we determine what's fake news? So we use, there's a lot of different sites out there that will help you determine me, uh, bias on different types of sites. So we use those to kind of help us gauge and actually looking at some of the sites and saying, yeah, this does look like crap. So uh, we use those. So again, we're trying to get to the, the most extremely misleading or flat out false, excluding things like parody sites and whatnot. Um, and then we tied a nice front end to it, so it'd make nice colors and whatnot whenever it found things. And then we ran this stuff a lot. So we would set up accounts, and then it would run and run and run, and then we would collect data about bots, fake news, and hate speech, but for this particular case, bots and fake news. So uh, it went out there and started doing its hunting and whatnot. And that was the first machine that we called, and we called it the, uh, the Hunter. Now, that looks for fake news and whatnot. Now, Lots of people built these similar types of machines. But we think our scoring mechanism is uh, fairly unique. There are plenty of other ways to do this. There's some people who are building machines that rely on uh, uh, machine learning and AI and whatnot. And those are certainly definitely good ways to, to go about this. Um, um, so we're not saying that necessarily ours is the best approach. This is just one that we found that worked very well for us. We also get suspicious, too. We'll see at certain times where some researchers will say, my software uh, can detect 99.5% of all the bots on Twitter. And we kind of look at that a little bit suspicious because it's, it's kind of difficult to get to that information unless you can somehow necessarily validate that what you call a bot is actually a bot, if that kind of makes sense. So um, anyways. To, to clarify also, um, so when we, say, when we say fake news, um, we try to exclude parody sites where possible. Uh, although parody is technically fake news, we're looking more at news that uh, attempts to influence or persuade. Um, in some cases, the sources that we use to uh, acquire the domains, um, some of those were shown as parody, and we've kind of had to dig through that. Um, but also, some were shown as neutral, and on further investigation, we're kind of uh, really far in one direction or the other. So, uh, the next machine that we build built uh, after building the Hunter uh, uh, would read what uh, the Hunter had found. And this one we call the Poster. So what the poster does, and this is where the research kind of flips around a little bit. What we ended up doing is we take some data that the hunter had found. So it's going through and finding different types of information. We randomly pick an a individual or whatnot out of the database. Uh, uh, and what the poster does is sends a message to that particular account. Uh, and it's a specially crafted URL. And the message is usually something about like this. We're trying to be as neutral as possible on this, so we just say things like, our system has identified you as a poster of possible you know, fake news. Are we wrong? Please come see our, our scoring. And then we can, you know, uh, you can see if that we're right or not, or we think that you're a bot or whatnot. And we create this kind of um, URL format where the ID is a unique ID into our system. And then the SHA is actually a random SHA to keep people from uh, um, enumerating through our tables, uh, tables and uh, 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 basically uh, uh, scraping our uh, databases. And we send one message to the user. We're not attempting to harass them. We're not attempting multiple, uh, multiple uh, messages. Um, 
So one thing that we noticed right off is that the uh, Twitter API is very well policed. So with that in mind, we knew the poster probably wouldn't work that well with that. Uh, you can bypass a lot of restrictions if you can just use the web interface. But uh, Twitter likes to make the web interface really, really difficult to use for, uh, uh, for automated routines. They obviously want you to do, uh, use their, um, their API. But our theory is that, or hypothesis I should say, is that a lot, a lot of the bad guys probably don't use the API because it's so well policed. So they go out of their way to probably use the, uh, the web front end. Uh, and this also gives us a chance to better understand what um, different uh, uh, attackers might be doing. Um, to, and, and also you can bypass a little bit of some of the restrictions. This clearly breaks the terms of services of Twitter, by the way, the second that you start doing this. So we called this particular uh, process the, the poster. So if you remember, there's that link that gets handed over to, that we hand over to the user. That, gets, uh, that goes to a website called botlogic.io. And we do everything that we promised that we would do. We take the user to a site, and in that site we explain why we consider them to be fake news, or not they'd be fake news, but why they might be posting that, or what, uh, why we think their score might add up to a bot. Um, what we also do is we collect the information of the user that was they came here. So that's the IP address and user agent that as it came. The ID helps us track, tag that stuff back. So we can uh, use that data later on. We also execute some JavaScript on the, the machine uh, as they come to our website. This does a couple of things for us. Uh, it helps us identify what is necessarily scraping uh, our site versus of what it might be actually human interaction and whatnot. So we run this, and by the way, um, this is the nature of JavaScript. It's not like we're doing something inherently different. Getting things like screen sizes and extensions and salt on, uh, from your web browser through executing JavaScript is, is what's done on the internet. Um, we also don't, for instance, for instance, try to obfuscate the code. Anybody who wants to look at this is, was more than welcome to. Um, so uh, uh, what that kind of information that comes back to us, it kind of tells us that, for instance, that we actually have a real person or user involved in it. And we get so a little bit of information out of it as well. So for instance, we get uh, what kind of browser it was, uh, what language was set, do you have certain applications installed, certain types of uh, uh, um, extensions and whatnot. Um, so that one we call the website. And then uh, that gets us a little bit more data and a little bit more deeper into things. If you were noticing very closely, you might have noticed some phone numbers and codes in here. Again, this also, the phone number is, allows the person, as they click on it, if they have a complaint about our service, that they can also call up and, and, and tell us what they think about it. So uh, the code, again, allows us to tie back to the, who the, the Twitter handle is, to who it is. Um, uh, so if you've ever seen any talks that I've ever done in, in the past, it always ends up where somewhere uh, telephony is involved. Um, so why would we do this? So really, the first thing we should point out is the first thing when somebody calls in, we immediately say this call will be recorded. It is going to be recorded. The, uh, we can use this information to kind of tie across between the various types of data that we get. Uh, to get things like ge uh, geographic uh, location and whatnot. But technically what makes it more interesting is that you end up with an open mic in the room of the person who's calling in. And you can find out, get a little, just a little bit more insight about uh, what, how their lives are lived. And it has the potential to be fairly funny as well. So this one we called the phone system. And those are the systems that we built and we put together. So if we look at it from a whole system overview, is there anything you want to add? Um, no? Well, the, yeah, the phone system, um, I'm not sure if you said this exactly, uh, it was kind of potentially awkward in, in how, it's, how it's set up so that it was roughly about 30 seconds of the, the open mic. Oh, uh, yeah, we, we potentially made sure that whenever we had uh, a caller on that we had them on hold and, and awkward uh, things so that we could see what was going on. Um, just to keep that mic active. So. Um, let's go back and just review the, uh, uh, how we're collecting the data. We have the Twitter API, which is really, really powerful, but to be honest, that all can all be set by the user, so it, it's, it's less trusted out of the, the data that we have. We can get things like um, IP addresses from the website, 
um, uh, which, which is good, but there's a lot of things, for instance, like the second that you post a link on Twitter, it immediately, immediately gets goggled up by, uh, by ironically, bots. Uh, for instance, like Facebook and Apple and whatnot. Um, if you've ever posted something and then like a link and then you go to look at your impressions and you say, wow, in 16 seconds I made 16 or, you know, three seconds I made 16 impressions, um, that's actually the bots going out and t checking out what your link is all about. You're not that popular. Um, <laughs> So uh, lastly, you have, things, you have things like the JavaScript that, that executes. What we found is about 13% of the people that we sent the, data, or the links to would actually end, end up executing the JavaScript. So, but it's a smaller set of data, but it's a lot more accurate. Um, on the last one, which is the, uh, the phone call, that was really, really low. Um, it was typically just a handful of calls a day. Basically, what we found is there's a bar that you have to meet before people get so angry that they call you. Um, and we met that bar a lot, but, <laughs> but, uh, uh, but there was one other thing that we realized that we needed to do um, uh, that was kind of important to this project. Um, so we started a limited liability corporation <laughs> and <laughs> do all of our findings through that. So really, um, uh, we are the board members of BotLogic. And these are the findings that we found uh, through uh, our company and organization. Um, and these are the findings. So, we're going to dive right in here a little bit. Um, go ahead. And, and again, just to just to um, uh, reiterate, you know, we're not saying that this is conclusive uh, evidence. Our findings are not, you know, they're not exact. Um, more research need, uh, is needed. Uh, more data is need to be collected and correlated. And uh, but based on on the best that we've been able to collect and analyze, this is. Uh, what we believe, and uh, we would like to hear your opinions also. Right, as you can tell, we're kind of hesitant to jump onto any hardcore conclusions. We, we, we only can deal with the data that we have, um, is, is kind of the point. So we make some hypothesis based off the data that we have. Um, and thank you for bringing that up. Um, our, so up to June 24, 2018, we'd analyzed about 2.4 million accounts, um, give or take. What we saw is about 2% of them uh, were people who usually posted things uh, related to fake news, which is about 57,000 uh, accounts. About half a percent was related in hate speech. But again, that could be fairly inaccurate. That one we'd need to look a little bit more at. And then uh, in that, about 7% or 172,000 and a half uh, appeared to be bots, according to our, our algorithm. So. To get started on this, let's get on looking at the data. Let's talk about the, uh, the bots. So out of that 7% that we found, we actually found the majority of bots don't really have any political uh, or uh, uh, political leanings, I guess you could say. And my point is you have many things like sports bots and, and quote bots and all these type of things. Um, uh, which, so it's not, this talk isn't to say that inherently all bots are bad, but what we were seeing is that most bots actually that we ran into uh, were not, did not have any political motivations behind them that we could tell. Um, uh, so we then kind of took the data that we could get from Twitter. So we basically went back and said, how many accounts uh, has Twitter disabled? And then, because what we could figured there is our, our thought process was that um, if we go back and we say these are bots, and then Twitter disables a bunch of things, then we're probably on the right track. We can use it as two different data sources to kind of line up, if that hopefully makes sense. And as you can see, the percentages aren't that far off as far as we can tell. Um, you know, uh, they have roughly the same pattern. Pattern: 22% of the ones that Twitter disabled, or roughly 38,000 uh, Twitter bots that were disabled out of the uh, 172,000. So it's kind of on par of what we were, our research shows. When we started to look deeper into it, bots with political motivations, uh, bots that w did have political motivations, and looked at what they mostly talked about, the common, most common thing, which is probably groundbreaking, and you guys never would have guessed it, is Trump. Um, Make America Great, and President, and a bunch of other ones as well um, uh, were in there as well. Um, but that's not terribly surprising. But what we started doing is kind of digging into the data a little bit more, and you can get kind of hone into uh, certain types of events. So this is a trend line of as we were detecting bots. So you, you can go back through and notice the dips and valleys and whatnot in this. Um, 
The data range for this particular set is from October 10th, 2017 to June 24th, 2018. And there's a peak in here, if you look, this is really kind of interesting, which is November 11th, 2017. Yeah, and again, just uh, keep bear in mind uh, before we change slides, the peak, the dip, the peaks, dip, peak, the kind of pattern there. Mm -hmm. So we're going to focus on this, and, but definitely note those dips. So that count right there is 1,076 bots detected by the BotLogic LLC Corporation. So we can turn around and say, okay, Twitter, when did you suspend uh, accounts? And we can kind of see very similar peaks and dips and whatnot. And this actually brings the count to uh, 494. Using that cross-referencing, we kind of can say, well, between our data and Twitter's own data, or what, through the suspended account, we can say that these are more than likely our bots, okay? It doesn't say they have a political motivation or anything like that, it's just saying that they're a bot, um, more than likely. So now we're at 494. And so we're using the two sets of data to better correlate, hopefully. Um, we continue the correlation uh, and we say, okay, how about the Twitter suspended accounts that are bot logic related that have a language that is set to RU? And we still end up with this peak over here. If you change it and you do things like CN that are you know, for Chinese or whatnot, that peak kind of goes away. So that stays right there. So that's kind of interesting. And, and, and I'm sorry, also, uh, this isn't just standard RU, this reflects all dialects. Oh, yeah, that's true. It reflects all dialects. Um, uh, this brings our count to 163. So then we say, okay, well, show us the ones that are suspended, that we have detected, that have RU, that seem to have political motivations behind them. And uh, that brings the count to 153. When we say political motivations behind them, we're saying that the tweets don't involve things like sports or something like that. They have direct uh, 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 tweets that seem to have political, or seem to be political in nature. Um, so at that particular point, we can kind of say, through some data that we have, it appears that during this particular time that there was likely some sort of possible, possibly uh, Russian influence, maybe, maybe not. But it is interesting to say the least. And we also see things like, if we go back to those particular counts and say, well, when were these counts created? You'll notice that there's a big spike shortly before that. So we get to looking at it and saying, well, what caused this, uh, this kind of, uh, um, you know, a little spike in uh, uh, data here in the beginning of November 2017. So when you look, we get to see tweets like this. So the key thing is here is actually the CNN blackmail thing, which I'll get onto here in a second. But there is a lot of bots that seem to be retweeting this. So we picked out the top one, and this was the top one out of our data set. And then we said, okay, out of that particular top tweet for this particular subject, based on all the data that we pulled, uh, what were... Uh, Russian versus um, uh, non-Russian. So, and out of this particular one, small, it's a very small data set. It basically says that 25 of them, this was 25 retweets, but roughly 19 of them, or 43%, actually had what appeared, at least had the language had been set. Um, it's not to say the other 57 isn't motivated or whatnot, or has, you know, uh, maybe a Russian influence, maybe not, but um, it's just saying what we have out of our data set. Then we look at the next one down, and we have kind of a similar thing. We have the CNN blackmail thing, once again, and then we look into that, and we say, well, how many uh, Russian RU set accounts versus non-RU bots are there? And then once again, this is 25 uh, uh, bots that were posting this, 18 of them uh, appear to have possibly uh, Russian ties, or 42%. Um, I'm wrong. Anyways, uh, <laughs> the, uh, the next one that we have here, and it, well, it kind of goes on and on. Basically, what we see here is that we, uh, uh, every time we go down the list, the percentages were roughly the same, and that the, there was uh, not quite half, a little under half, but they seemed to have uh, at least RU associated with it. When we took the data set as a whole, we would notice that it actually flips quite a bit. So we said, okay, show us everything that was related on this particular day with all the data sets, the Twitter suspensions, RU, all that, and non-RU. We put it all together and we say, show me everything. Uh, we see that it ends up to be about 72% or 181 and 51 uh, per, or 51 bots or 28% that are non-RU uh, related. Are you going to say something? Okay. No. Now, does anybody remember what the CNN blackmail thing was about? Me either. I didn't remember either. So um, 
Donald Trump had decided, uh, uh, well, okay, there was a uh, animated GIF that was going around and it showed um, uh, a Donald Trump literally body slamming the CNN logo. Uh, in, in a wrestling match. And um, doing as any president should do, he, he immediately retweeted to all of his fo followers because he's president and that's what you do. So um, uh, a CNN reporter actually tracked down the kid who made this meme and it was a Reddit user. Uh, but when was, CNN actually went to him, they said uh, he apologized and uh, said he wasn't going to do this again and, and evidently it showed uh, a lot of remorse. But when CNN published the article, they decided that they would put these words in it. CNN reserves the right to publish the identity should any of that change. And hence the reason CNN blackmail was born. And what we're seeing is probably a, our, our hypothesis is, is a uh, trying to amplify the voices of uh, the CNN blackmail. Not everything about it was about the CNN whole blackmail thing. So we're kind of latching onto it to get other kinds of uh, political, uh, possible political motivations out there. Um, on the CNN uh, uh, hashtag, the CNN blackmail hashtag. Uh, one thing that we did also notice as well is that a lot of the bots, and again, these are probably, this is, has nothing to do with, this is just bots in general. Most of them set their location to complete an utter gibberish. Um, uh, so it might be a, a thing to be look at for as an indicator. Um, but let's move on to a little bit of fake news. So by far the top fake news website that we saw is yournewswires.com, which was solid, had a, a, uh, right behind it was, uh, excuse me, it was yournewswires.com and Got News was right behind it. And you'll see there's some ones in here like southfront.org, which has been previously reported in the past as being a Russian front. That was still about 4% of our queries. Um, when we look at the data from Twitter, you would think that the majority of people who are posting fake news are actually out of uh, Las Vegas, Nevada. But I remind you again, this information is probably the least uh, accurate because it's user set. Um, so what we can do, we can pivot over to the IP addresses, uh, which gives you some indication about what's going on. And if we look here, then we say, oh my gosh, California is the biggest place uh, to, to post fake news, which seems a little bit strange, but it's because it is. Because you remember, whenever I said he post a uh, link, it usually gets gobbled up by other bots. So, and those bots are like these. So, for instance, uh, the Twitter bot is obviously the top one. Uh, so, when it does a link, um, whenever you put a link up there, it gobbles it up first. You have other things like um, Yahoo and Apple and whatnot. But by going by the, um, um, the user agent, we can kind of clean up the tables to hopefully give us a little bit of a better picture of where most, most people are posting fake news uh, from. Um, so when we clean it up a little bit, California kind of goes away here. And then we end up with Florida, Georgia, uh, and up near the Great Lakes. There's some stuff uh, in Europe, um, I won't go into much into this, because this is again uh, something that I actually, uh, we're focusing more on the United States. But anyways, to get over to the more relevant slide, after cleaning it up, I mean, this isn't terribly surprising either. Florida and Georgia are the top the news posters, that's stunning. But um, we can go actually a little bit further because the IP data, even though we've cleaned it up, we don't know if we've cleaned it up 100%, but we do have a smaller subset of data which leads us back to JavaScript. So we can look at the JavaScript that was executed and we can say, again, Florida, Georgia, Southern California, which is one actually that I didn't expect. And you can kind of get a layout there where most of the people who bring up this type of stuff is. Do you have anything? Yeah. So, um, with this kind of data, you can also get into individual targeting. Um, one thing that comes up a lot whenever we think of uh, fake news or and whatnot, we can tend to think of it as a uh, uh, bots pushing conservative agendas. And what we're able to kind of show a little bit of is that, that that's not necessarily always the case. It appears that um, people play both sides of the uh, the argument, probably to sow discourse uh, uh, into us. So. We have three young ladies here. There's uh, Veronica and Dina, and they're from Ohio, and one's from California, and they're all members of the Resist Movement, and they're all very anti-Trump. Uh, they all said this verbatim, uh, separately from one another, uh, which is part of the logic that we have in finding uh, bots. That they aren't retweeting each other, they're all saying this individually. Um, and they all speak Russian, and they're, all their accounts are suspended. So. If we look a little bit further into what they're promoting, these are kind of more left-leaning sites. And if I could say, the, uh, the, the way that we know that they said the things verbatim, 
Um, back earlier, uh, Beef talked about doing SHA ones. So that every tweet that we recorded, uh, we have a SHA one of. So if we compare the SHAs, um, then it's apparent which ones are uh, uh, original. So we could tie people together as saying uh, verbatim type of thing. So we could say maybe this is part of some sort of campaign. These uh, uh, women were posting uh, mostly like uh, Vegas Hill, Denver Poll, hillpress.org, and other sites. And this one's a Denver Poll. And so they, these sites use a lot of like loaded terms, one on the left-hand side of things. And you'll see the stunning uh, uh, differences between all the sites. They're almost exactly the same. This is uh, vegashill.com. So probably run by the same, same type of groups and whatnot. We can also pull, so after we saw this type of campaign, we can pull the domains that they're, or websites that they're talking about and do some interesting things with Multigo. I'll let you talk about tracking codes. You want to go into that? So, yeah, this was, um, I don't remember if it was Web Breacher or uh, Mark Bellencat. Uh, it's not an original concept, uh, but effectively taking uh, websites, finding different uh, tracking codes, for example, Google Analytics tags, um, AdSense, AdWords. Um, so the types of things that are uh, typically administered by you know a single point, you know, website owner might track several of their websites using these tags, and it helps them see which uh, search terms uh, attract people, what sites they come from, and and uh, that sort of thing. Um, so what we've identified is through some of these sites uh, where we followed followed the tw the tweeters to their websites, find the websites, grab the tracking codes from the tracking codes. Um, we've been able to find matches. For example, we see that um, Vegas Hill has two separate uh, codes there. It shares both those with epolitico.us. It shares one of those with superhill.info. Uh, superhill.info we see has two tags. One of those it shares with denverpoll.com. Um, so then we've also been able to pivot, for example, from epolitico.us um, to suarenetizen.com. And we've done this with a, a number of different sites, but it's an interesting way. Um, again, not necessarily a uh, you know, nail in the coffin, uh, but it does appear to be a good identifier uh, to help associate um, websites that may, on the surface, not appear to be related. Right. So what we do too, as well, we would use this method to actually find other sites that maybe are fairly new. So if somebody like these uh, ladies had posted a particular site, we would grab that, pull the analytics tags, and then start using those to find other sites and kind of kind of expand out. Um, we also found uh, just so this is kind of another example of that exact same thing. Um, so for instance, there is a website called usdcrisis.com, and I'm pretty sure everybody in here knows who rt.com is, so, right? Russia Today, of course. Um, uh, the uh, usdcrisis.com is a site that talks about how sanctions on Russia hurts the US dollar and uh, whatnot. It's actually uh, an amazingly screwed up website. The forums are kind of screwed up and whatnot. But it's hosted in Newcastle, England by ISP called Wildcard UK Unlimited. Um, and so we pull the analytics tags for uh, usdcrisis.com and we start looking at them. The ones on the far right and the far left largely lead to nowhere. But then whenever you look at the middle particular analytic, it leads all back over to rt.com. Now, keep in mind analytic tags are used so that you can see who's, uh, um, how much traffic is coming to your website. There is some gaming that can be done with analytic tags, but it's hard for us to understand why somebody would necessarily go out of their way. Again, as he was pointing out, this isn't to say that this is some sort of nail in the coffin kind of thing, but it's a strange indicator that there might be a possible link between the two. The person who has, for instance, usdcrisis.com, all of his analytics now go to the console that the RT people have. Like by doing this. So it doesn't make a lot of sense to us uh, by that. So that's kind of a hypothesis that we have. And you can do this with a lot of different types of sites. So for instance, uh, this is cbsnews.com.co and freedomcrossroads.us and cnn-globalnews.com and Florida Sun Post. The highlighted domains are the ones that appear to be uh, are you related? The rest of them are typically porn sites and things of that nature, some online gambling and whatnot. Uh, here's an older one that uh, uh, happened a while back. This is A News 24, and it's an older fake news uh, site. It actually, I think, has been bought up by an Asian uh, furniture manufacturer. If you go there now, they sell furniture. But at the particular time, they were doing much more than that, or different things. And almost every indicator on this particular one, this is, this, again, this is an older one. And uh, uh, what we find interesting is that we have, um, uh, this is like an example of news thing that used to, that used to came from anews24.com, talking about Denzel Washington switching over to Trump. 
Um, needless to say, whenever you do this type of research, especially the way that we're doing it, we get some very, very interesting response because not only can we talk to them, but they can talk back to us. So right off the bat, and I'll leave this up here for a second, you get a lot of the same type of things that we would normally expect to get. You know, a lot of people really, really mad and whatnot, and it's fine. And I understand that. You actually do get some people who are, are pretty smart. Again, only about 13% of the people that we sent any links to actually clicked on anything, which is pretty good. So we occasionally we would get these as well. And there, you know, I'm, no way I'm presenting. A lot of people just didn't click on it. We got some uh, that were a little bit more confusing and showed the need for things like punctuation. Um, <laughs> and, <laughs> or, or they really want to prove that they're not a bot. I don't understand how that works. But um, uh, that was one of our favorites. So some of them made us smile a lot. Um, I would, uh, let's go into the phone system a little bit. Uh, um, there is, again, all the stuff, we've taken a lot of stuff, uh, we can get into incredible detail of this type of research. But again, we're trying to uh, protect the identities uh, uh, of, the, uh, of the people. Uh, so would you like to hear some of the stuff that maybe the bot logic phone system heard? Yeah. Okay, and cool. We have a couple of things. And, and also, uh, real quick, uh, Ill Will put out a tool called Skip Tracer. Uh, use that with some of the phone numbers that were all the phone numbers we had. <laughs> right, uh, and it's actually pull, a very good utility. Uh, really some, uh, you know, a lot of information uh, from these accounts. So I'd like to thank him for that tool. Okay, so we're going to go for this here. Uh, uh, this is a person named Joe. He was born in 1959. Uh, he tends to post fake news. He's from Tennessee. He's actually, he's from an un unincorporated area just outside of Chattanooga. Um, he uses Firefox. He has Flash installed. He works at a, uh, a company that develops and manufactures and markets pharmaceutical products. Um, and a lot of the information, again, through using things like Ill Will's tool, you get things like email addresses and whatnot. Uh, and hopefully you guys will be able to hear this, um, and here it comes. So. I do not appreciate an algorithm or a robot or a computer calling me a liar. I am a real person. I do not tell lies, and I can back my stuff up with facts, unlike the fa fake news that you accuse me of promoting. I do not appreciate this. <clears throat> I don't know if uh, I don't know where the uh, uh, who the source is of this, uh, but but I'll tell you this: I will testify against you on Judgment Day. So. so um he also called us uh mark zuckerberg's robot and a few other things which i think is a great band name by the way um uh and whatnot so you know he was uh but we also had people who didn't like us so um this is uh, John. He was born in 1953. He tweets a whole lot. We actually did identify him as a bot. The last one, actually, we did not identify as a bot. We didn't ever call him bot. We never said anything about that. We well, said that you might be fo posting fake news. Um, we, uh, he lives in Colorado. He uses Chrome. He's a wonder. He's a lovely individual. Yeah, it's it's. Uh, well, that's that's. I better say that. Um, <laughs> I'll just, I'll just go ahead. So this is what Joe, or yes, uh, John had to say uh, to us. My name is John. Phone number. I'm calling zero, 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 about this bullshit you're saying about me on the internet, on Twitter, that I'm a fucking bot. All you're trying to do is fucking suppress conservatives, right? I know you're fucking not going to call me back, but I'm going to keep fucking calling you until you answer the goddamn phone, pieces of shit. So again, lovely. And he kept true to his word to a particular degree. He called again. It's John. It's me again. I said, fine. Still trying to get all these lying fucking propaganda left this piece of shit. Don't worry, I'm fucked with you like you've never been fucked with before, assholes. Um, I have never been called libtard so many times in my life. <laughs> Um, so we checked the, uh, you know, well, why do we think these people were fake news? And we looked at the news, and it is some of the stuff like Obama's a lizard person and, and things like that. <laughs> and and it, it's striking that, you know, the, these people consider this real news. It's, it's interesting. Right. Um, and here is one more that we'll throw out here. I'm not going to even put, put her uh, name or anything out there. She has a very unique 
nickname from Louisiana. Tweet a lot. Uh, she uses an Android, uh, Android 4.4.4. We can back that up with her screen size and whatnot. Uh, what she, her initial tweet was about this, that hackers had taken over uh, control of the US Navy tech and launched a missile to shoot down uh, Trump uh, while he was en route to North Korea. Um, you guys didn't hear about that? <laughs> oh, I thought that was pretty common knowledge. Um, so here, hers is really short and sweet, and, and that's kind of nice. Here's my message. Do I sound like a goddamn bot to you? Screw this shit. Don't ever send me messages again. And, and we didn't. Um, <laughs> so, so there was that. Um, there are a lot more recordings, as I said, well, let me rephrase that. There are probably 30 or so recordings that we have. Uh, we didn't want to put them all on a slide, but you're welcome to call the BotLogic LLC phone number and feel free to listen to them at your convenience. <laughs> they are played randomly, they are edited, so, uh, and it is the full conversation uh, from beginning to end of the, uh, the talk. Um, what's that? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We had um, a counterpart, a friend of ours, who really helped us with a lot of the, uh, the editing of these, because it takes a little bit of time, uh, named uh, Jen Cryption. And I just wanted to kind of give a shout out to her. Um, we cannot release the, uh, the, the data that we, our data sets, uh, for legal reasons. Um, however, we can release tools that you, we use to generate the data, or make the data sets. So this is the where you can go to get the code that we use to, to uh, find bots and, and all that fun stuff. Really Release it under GPL version two. It's mostly written in Perl. Um, and, oh, and one thing I'd like to point out: if you have any questions and you didn't get a chance to ask them, or you didn't get to see us, or you're watching this from remote or by YouTube, feel free to open an issue, and then we'll answer your question that way. Um, uh, I'll give some just really quick final thoughts about uh, about this project as we go through. So. Um, uh, Twitter is actually policing their platform fairly well, and they seem to be getting even more and more aggressive with it. They recently terminated anybody who had an age that was under 16, I believe it was. Uh, they are getting a lot more aggressive about it. it it's, they're really in a bad situation because um, no matter what they do to try to keep people from, say, using the web interface for posting, there's always going to be a way around it. So, for instance, if they use a lot of JavaScript to try to keep you from just directly logging in, and we figured out little ways to get around that. But the fact is, is even if they made us use it, we would just use a web browser and things like mechanized Chrome that would allow us to automate web browsing functions. So they really have a, uh, a hard task ahead of them, and it's still fairly easy to evade, especially on the web front end. Uh, uh, some of their um, uh, things to detect bots and whatnot. Um, and doing this stuff is pretty cheap uh, for the most part, as you said. The, um, as you said, if you, there's probably professionals who do this and they do it way cheaper than we do. Um, but these thing, types of operations are really hard to maintain. You gotta create accounts, you gotta get them set up, they get suspended, you gotta set more up. You gotta, so it's constantly, it's, kinda, it's, it's, it's a pretty ongoing type of thing. Uh, it takes a lot of time and patience. Um, and the fact is, is actually Twitter has the best data sets, but we're certainly not going to see them. So sometimes you have to kind of take that data if you can. One thing that I think about when I think about social media and Twitter and whatnot is um, who was into BBSs in the 80s? All right. OK. In the 80s, do you remember what happened after Christmas Day? Everybody got a modem. And they would call in, and then everybody who was already on BBSs uh, would hate everybody who just got modems because all those kids would get on and they'd say, I'm the best hacker in the world and screw all you guys. And what would eventually happen is they would either uh, uh, kind of fall into place and become a part of the scene, so to speak, or they get tired of using their modem and throw it away. Uh, I'm kind of hoping that this is what's happening with social media, like maybe the next generation or so, we won't see it as so divisive that it, the tool that it can be and simply a means of communication. But uh, until that day, this, this is where we're at. And um, that's pretty much our final thoughts on this. So I guess if we have some time, which I think we do. One minute. A minute or two for questions? Perfect, okay. And again, if you have any questions and you don't get a chance, feel free to open an issue on GitHub. But please go ahead. Thank you. Ready? Hi there. I'd like to thank you for your presentation. Thank you. In case you don't know me, let me introduce myself. I'm from the internet. <laughs> We've met some of you. 
Yeah, man. You aren't yeah. nice. No, um, <laughs> I'm not going to be as all colorful as those uh, people that, uh, you know, those flyover country, low information people that were on those, uh, right. those recordings that you offered. But um, I do have a comment. I was actually at Charlotte's film. Um, oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, I was actually there. So uh, I witnessed. Um, not to that incident, but uh, to some of the events that went down. So just, just for reference, not everyone is uh, getting their information secondhand. Uh, there are flesh and blood human beings <laughs> that, uh, you know, are real and do tweet and do stuff. So uh, being one of those, um, I just wanted to, uh, to ask you, because this is a question, um, I wanted to ask, being like any zero information person can flip on the TV and get the, the whole Russian shebang that you kind of went through, rather a lot of effort, I must say, to uh, demonstrate here. Mm -hmm. um, why did you feel the need to go through with this? You know, to prove something that's kind of... You mean from, from our standpoint? Yeah, I mean, you know, because I mean, you could just flip on the TV and that you get all of the so-called intelligence community certifying, absolutely certifying that sure. you know, we know who was behind it. Right? Well, right, right. Yeah, so I mean, what, what gives with all the effort? I'm, but I'm just It was curious. trying to understand Thanks. the motivations of how particular operations run. So for instance, like fake news operations and bots like that. We wanted to see it, not just necessarily just read about it. One thing I should point out too, whenever we talk, uh, I neglected to bring up, when a lot of people focus on the facts of the fake news, so they'll find a news site and they'll say it's full in, you know factually incorrect we think uh, as from a hacker standpoint, looking at the site from more technical standpoints gives us more of an idea of what the motivations might be as well. So you know, you're not just looking at the words that are on the page, but you're using tools like Maltigo and tracking codes and other techniques to maybe figure out what the motivations are and th those kind of things. Uh, hopefully, I answer. Unfortunately, uh, the next talk has to start setting up. Uh, I apologize. Uh, All good. We will definitely be available and we'll be around. Oh, we have, um, well, here, I'll just show them as we get off stage. We have some shirts that say Trolling the Trolls on the back, and you'll be able to see us. So thank you very much. Okay.